So I was saying, yeah, P Pinot Noir, it's so much more than just a grape. You know, it's a philosophy, a, a mantra, a, a reason to live. Um, I, I hate to be really biased and opinionated. Actually, no, I don't. That's actually not true at all. Um, but but I, I have a very soft spot for, for Pinot Noir. I mean, it's um, it's uh, it, it just makes some of the world's finest wines. It really, really does. Um, hugely satisfying. Uh, enriching, hedonistic, but cerebral at the same time. Oh, um, Ali, you're waving a bottle. You're waving a bottle in our direction. Hang on, Charlie. Can you see what Ali? Ali was waving something. I didn't quite see what, but but anyway, um, you can help. Charlie, me. I'll message you. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, and um, you know the 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 history of the grape. Um. It's thought really to uh, start back with the um, Aidui tribe, in fact, uh, in the first century BC. And there's every indication that it was brought over to Burgundy uh, by the tribesmen, and then uh, basically when they were running away from the Romans, in fact. So um, we, we've called this session Global Pinot Noir, Burgundy and Beyond, because you could never talk about Pinot Noir without talking about Burgundy. And, you know, frankly, it is, it is the heartland of the grape. And just as perhaps um, no um, Cabernet Sauvignon based wine, whether it's Napa Valley um, or, or Barossa or South Africa can consider itself a great Cabernet unless it stacks up uh, against, against the great wines of the left bank of Bordeaux. Similarly, uh, Pinot Noir from anywhere else does tend to have to pass the Burgundy test. It, it tends to have to, you know, stack up against um, the, the, the original version. So, um, yeah, the wines being, well, Pinot Noir has been growing in Burgundy, uh, well, since about the first century BC and then certainly well into the first century AD. We'll talk a bit more about Burgundy itself, because obviously it's such a big feature with, with wild wine number two. Um, but as a, as a grape itself, what are its defining characteristics? Firstly, and I'll be honest, the first wine we're going to be tasting, and everyone, there's no reason why you shouldn't crack on with the first wine, um, isn't necessarily the best example of this, although it's not bad, but one of the first um, characteristics you notice about Burgundy is the colour. Um, sorry, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir is the colour. Pinot Noir has a, a, a relatively thin skin by comparison to uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot or Syrah slash Syrah. Um, so it tends to uh, give a naturally lighter coloured wine, more of a garnet colour to begin with. Um, so that's the first thing, it tends to be quite a light or a mid to light coloured wine. Then the, um, the aromatic character of young Pinot Noir really tends to be very much on the red fruit side of the spectrum. It, it's not black cherries, black plums, be more, you know, red berries, red plums, raspberries, red currants, that sort of style of red fruit. And then as Pinot Noir ages, it tends to take on more of this um, slightly kind of barnyardy character, more, um, uh, uh, maybe a touch more licorice, certainly a bit more kind of old hay, um, more tobaccic character. The fruit becomes more burnished. Um, it's, 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 it just is beautiful as it ages. Good Pinot Noir ages really, really well. But because it doesn't have as much tannin, for example, as Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, Syrah slash Shiraz, um, it really relies on one key element for its structure, and that is the acidity. So good Pinot Noir should always have a really good kind of plumb line core, a great vein of acidity, which just runs throughout the wine. And that's what keeps it very much alive and kicking and can allow it to age for many, many years, in fact. So um, our, um, our first wine, we're, we're, it's funny, you'd, you'd think in some respects we'd, um, we'd start with Burgundy, but actually we're not. We're going to start with the, the simplest, the simplest of the, of the wines we have this evening. Um, and this is um, uh, the Gracebridge Pinot Noir from uh, the Scotto Cellars, 
who are based in uh, Lodi in California. So I'm going to do that clever thing now, which I'm learning to do quite well, where I pull up a map. So unless, Charlie, do you have the map? Or shall I can do it? No, I'll do it. Fine. No problem. OK, so here we go. Prepare to be amazed. Uh, right. Uh -huh. In fact, no, that's not quite right. Don't worry. I'll get there. Whilst just talk amongst yourself. Perfect. Oh, look at that. There it is. Right. Let's share that bad boy. OK. Um, no, no, no. Do, 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 do. God, I've got too many screens open here. Apologies. It will come up. Right, let's give that a go. No, let's not give that. Let's give that a go. Now, is everyone seeing a map of the Central Coast? Can I get a thumbs up? Um, perfect. Yes, good, brilliant, thank you. So um, our, um, our first wine um, here, the... Um, uh, the Gracebridge Pinot uh, really comes, some of, some of the fruit is sourced down here in Monterey and then the, the, the rest of the fruit is actually from Sonoma which is a bit further north. Um, oh Charlie, just so you know there's three more people just entered. Um, if you want to let them in that would be nice. Ah here we go, here we go. Um, oh, wait a second, sorry, it's not being very helpful. Not the North Coast. I want this one. Here we go. That's better. So um, here we have M Monterey down uh, in the Central Coast area to the south, where the fruit is really quite warm. Uh, the winery, the Scotto winery, is based in Lodi here, just uh, outside Sacramento. And then the other half of the fruit comes from Sonoma here, which is kind of firmly in what we term as the North Coast of, uh, of California. Um, and obviously what this gives you is um, the slightly cooler fruit uh, of the north, giving crispness, acidity and freshness, and then the warmer, riper uh, fruit down here in Monterey in the central coast area, giving you a bit more spice and, um, and richness, in fact, and warm, warm fruit. Still glad to say we're, we're at 13, 13 and a half alcohol, so it's not kind of big and jammy or anything like that. Definitely, you get a little bit of that Central Coast warmth uh, coming out. I'm going um, to stop showing the screen now because it's kind of weird looking at a map when I know you're behind it. Um, but if anyone else wants to go back to that map at any point, just uh, let me know. Um, mm. So um, the um, um, Scotto Cellars was... Um, quite a nice kind of classic um, um, classic story really. Um, the Scotto family, it was Dominic Scotto in fact, um, emigrated from the uh, from Ischia, Ischia in fact on the Italian coast in 1893 and his father had made wine but um, Dominic ended up in Brooklyn uh, around about the turn of the century and um, and he sort of started a wine shop. And the, the rather glorious thing uh, is that the um, Scotto uh, family um, uh, wine shop is still there. It's, it's still there in, um, in Brooklyn, in fact. And, and that was set up in, in the 30s. So I think pretty much straight out of um, after Prohibition and stuff, they, they got going and they set up the, uh, the wine shop. Um, and then they started moving into wine production over in California in uh, 1963 um, was the first vintage. Yeah. And, and now I guess it's the fifth generation down. Um, there's about three or four or five members of the family. I guess um, a couple of the key figures are Anthony, who's the CEO, and his brother Paul, who is the head winemaker. And they are doing some really good things, I have to say. Um, an, interesting, um, an interesting comment from uh, Richard Hemming, uh, Master of Wine, who writes for Jancis Robinson. Um, I'm going to read it to you. I read it down here earlier. Um, he said that the most rare wine in the world is good, proper Pinot Noir 
for under 15 pounds a bottle. That's the real holy grail. Now, to be fair, he wrote that about the 2013 vintage in 2017. And we are now all on the, um, I believe it's the 16th. Yeah. And we're, and we're three years on. Um, but the wine has still kept very, very reasonably priced for a grape, which tends to be, you know, pretty expensive. It's, un, it's not typical to get quality Pinot Noir for much under 20 pounds. It really isn't. And this has been hugely popular. Uh, the Grace Bridge is, uh, it's definitely one of our best selling wines um, and always has been. Um, it, it, I think for me, it offers very, very accessible, ripe, uh, soft fruit, but at the same time, there's enough structure there and that kind of vein of acidity that I mentioned is still just kind of poking there that allows you to, um, um, it's Moorish basically, it, it keeps the, um, the hinge of the jaw uh, nicely, nicely kind of juicing up beyond another glass. Um, any, um, any comments at this stage, questions, queries, um, please uh, feel free, raise a hand or, uh, or in chat or hang on, I'm just looking out as I can to see anyone uh, mentioning anything. Oh yeah, Sue, Sue, hang on Sue, are you no, unmuted? I was to say, mine tastes a little dusty, which is a slightly strange description, but it does taste a little bit dusty. So, um, um, I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. I think what's quite interesting about the um, um, uh, about this wine is that it's actually 2016, so it's definitely showing more than just the primary fruit, more than that red currant fruit. You're unquestionably getting um, these either dusty or like dusky sort of tannins. There's um, a slight earthiness beginning to come through for sure, um, and that's very much. I hope what one would expect from Pinot Noir as it starts to mature, that you're moving away from the very primary character and definitely getting a, a touch of earth, a touch of balsamic maybe. Um, um, certainly, uh, almost it's almost like that kind of chalk dust on a blackboard kind yeah. of uh, yeah, aroma as well. Yeah, which is, yeah, which I have to say I find rather appealing because um, I think, you know, this wine is delightful when it's young, but at the same time, it clearly takes on some more interesting, complex character with a little bit of age. And I think that that kind of, you know, I, I, I said earlier um, how with Pinot Noir ages, it sort of takes on like a barnyard character. We're not at that full sweet hay character, but we're definitely moving a little bit more towards that, that meadow character, you know, a touch of the farmyard maybe as well. And this is what we'd expect. Um, so a couple of questions here. Uh, da, da, da. First of all, Henry, what food would you recommend it this with this? Yes. Um, would it work chilled? Yes. Yes, totally. Um, um, for, for me, this is such a, um, a, a pleasant and accessible wine. It's very, very versatile. It really is. I, I, it's, if I'm honest, it's not so much what would I pair it with as what would I not pair it with, I think is a better answer um, in the sense that um, because it is definitely, you know, light to medium bodied or medium to light minor, something like that to use WSET uh, nomenclature. Um, I wouldn't you I wouldn't have it with anything that's too um, uh, too powerfully flavored. You could certainly chill it, and I'd be delighted to have this with something like, um, you know, barbecued um, uh, or grilled tuna steak, something like that. It's great. It's great with the heavier fish dishes. Possibly, because of the warmth and the ripeness, some slightly spicier, not massive spice, but, you know, some sort of spiced kind of prawns, uh, for example, would work really nicely. On the meat front, this isn't a steak wine for me. This is not this is not a wine I would have with with big with big kind of amounts of meat. Frankly, probably you know uh, like it's it California. Is. It, it, we could go hot dogs. We could go. go uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could go grilled. Uh, go, to yeah. get on the grill, but it's California, so everything's light with a, a slight reduction in uh, in fat value. Very boringly in California. So um, yeah, but. <laughs> Yeah, actually, but yeah, 
Charlie, Charlie makes uh, um, uh, many, many good points, but, but particularly there. Um, yes, it is interesting that, you know, um, sometimes um, like a, 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 a cut of meat, which, which is very fatty, really needs a wine with a considerable amount of tannin to counterbalance that fat. Um, whereas obviously a leaner, leaner meats don't, don't need the presence of tannins in wine so much. Uh, but I do think the acidity helps. So, so yeah, this is probably great with a Californian diet. Um, you know, it's great with your Mackie rolls, frankly. So uh, it's pretty versatile. Um, fish and chips. Okay. Yeah, Benjamin, that's interesting. Fish and chips. Um, I, I, if I did, I'd have it chilled. If I did, I'd have it chilled. And I'd probably, I probably would have a fair bit of tartar sauce as well to give the acidity back in the dish. Um, um, Catherine and Mark are suggesting lamb tagine. Well, definitely the spice element in the wine, which is beginning to push through as it opens in my nice big Riedel glass, um, means that it, it, it will stand up to something which has a nice bit of spice. Not too much heat, but a bit. And then um, a comment um, from Seth and Dom earlier was about the, the forest fires. Yeah. So um, before we kind of move on from California, it's, it's worth just talking about, I suppose, the, um, you know, climate change, climate issues. And certainly the last few years, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just uh, last year. I mean, the, 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 unfortunately, California has been beset by some pretty serious fires. Um, now, it's been more damaging to the infrastructure around the wineries and the vineyards themselves in the main. You know, it's been terrible, of course, for a lot of the vineyard workers who live nearby um, and a lot of the conurbations around the vineyards. But um, it's really only been 2017, which uh, had a noticeable kind of smoke taint on some of the grapes, so much so that, you know, um, a, a, an amount of the, the crush was just dropped. A lot of the grapes were just left aside. Um, you know, it's, 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 we, we are going to see, we are going to see some wines from the 2017 vintage, uh, which do maybe have smoke, which is not from the terroir or not from the grape, but maybe more from sadly the uh, external influences. But by and large, I think most producers were sufficiently conscious about keeping the quality level up that they um, that they kind of you know didn't use the grapes which were in any way affected. And then uh, Jeremy asking how long would you keep this one for? I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, it's 2016. It's beginning its secondary evolution. It's great now. I mean, I I I I, I would struggle to see much of a reason for keeping it you know, beyond the next couple of years, because I think we're at that point where the, you know, the freshness is right at the balance. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's tasting, it's tasting really nicely evolved now. Mm. Tom, so, I'm, not, um, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not, um, I'm not afraid to display my ignorance, but I've got an ignorant question to ask you. Not for, not um, for the any... first time. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. Um, can a screw top wine cork? That's a, a very, a very interesting point. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna, it's, it's not an ignorant question at all, Sine. It's a, it's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with it briefly now, just so we can move on to the next wine. But um, uh, the, the, the simple answer is no. Simple answer is no. Um, the, the whole benefit of screw caps is that effectively, um, they are, uh, they, well, they, they don't allow any degree of oxidation or oxidization, I should say. That's the whole point of having them, that it reduces that opportunity um, down to a, a, a factor of like one bottle in 40 or 50 rather than one in 12, which reputedly was the way we corked. Um, the other thing, of course, um, when we talk about a wine being corked, often that is an umbrella term to cover a number of different faults. Um, and of course, one of the faults that you can have with a wine under a cork is that it has TCA. And now this is a chemical problem with the cork itself. So uh, obviously you can't have that with a screw cap. It doesn't mean that wines under screw cap can't have um, some other faults, but not the ones we would associate with a wine being corked. 
So I hope that'll do for now. So that was a pretty brief answer. Um, wine glasses, what do you recommend? Well, I won't go through brands. I will go through brands. It's got to be, it's got to be Zalto. I love Zalto. They're brilliant. Um, I'm not drinking from a Zalto tonight um, because I, I just, I'm not. It's so silly. Charlie is. Well done. But Zalto's are the best. Um, with Pinot Noir, to keep things on track, you want a, you want a glass with a big bowl. Charlie, if you hold up your glass, because that is a, that's a Pinot Noir glass, basically. So if everyone looks at Charlie in the corner there, that's a nice, in fact, that's not a Pinot Noir glass, but it'll do. It'll do. Mm. I think it is the burgundy glass, actually. Salto's it? burgundy. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. It looks a bit, it looks yeah. a bit fatter. Well, no, uh, uh, sorry, it looks a bit fatter at the rim. No, normally, I'm looking with... out, I've been sorry. Oh, maybe it's you, Charlie. Sorry, sorry, it's actually, yeah. You, you've been, it's, <laughs> that, that green egg has been getting a lot of use, hasn't it? Yeah, okay. That, that's actually a sherry glass, isn't it? Yeah. No, other way <laughs> no, hang on, that would be the other way around. But anyway. Um, so, um, the brandy goblet. No, so it's a good point, which I won't dwell on for too long, but in terms of what glass one might use with, uh, with Pinot Noir, um, actually the glass shape and style that Charlie has, and I can see David down here in the corner has a good looking uh, burgundy style glass. Graham's probably a touch more on the Bordeaux front like the one I'm drinking from, but what you really want with Pinot Noir is a, a, a more of a brandy goblet style glass, you know, that really opens the wine up, let the aromatics develop, but then concentrates them again when it comes to the nose. So, um, boom, boom, boom. okay, I think we'll we'll move on now to wine number wines number this, two. Sorry, sorry, Tom. This mm. this is the Rydal one they sell as the Pinot Noir. Oh yeah. Okay. Very short. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It, with, Mark, did that have a short stem, or is that the, or is that Virtually where you're no holding? Virtually no stem at all. That's quite fun. I quite like that. Yeah, because what the the one thing with the the real yeah. glasses, I have to say, and I do have a number of them, is that they're a complete bugger to. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the stems, the stems break, and you know yeah. you're in trouble. No, I, I lost the. I've got three out of the last four that I had. Yeah, exactly yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it's. <laughs> It's sadly, uh, you know, uh, casualties of, uh, of war, I have to say. Um, and the burgundy ones in particular, they're so heavy, the bowls. I lost two the other day just um, having rinsed them. I was just drying them, like flicking them like that. And the heads just fell off. And that was <laughs> really annoying, obviously. I, I, I broke one the other night, the same similar thing. Yeah. So um, we're now moving on to the, the heart of the matter. I mean, we really are. We're, we're into burgundy. Um, and, you know, Burgundy, as I mentioned, has been cultivating Pinot Noir since uh, first century BC and certainly well into first century AD. Um, but things got really interesting in the 1300s when um, the Cistercians um, kind of rolled into town. The Benedictines had been knocking around in Burgundy for 200 years or so at least, but it was the Cistercians who built um, the Chateau de Clovougeau which obviously still stands today in 1336. And they were the first, um, probably in the world, actually, the first people in the world to start recognizing that, um, you know, if you plant certain grapes in different areas of the vineyard, and Clos Vougeau is, a, is quite a big vineyard and it's still there and it's a walled vineyard, it's a Grand Cru vineyard in Burgundy, that different parts of um, the, uh, the vineyard with different grapes would yield different types of wine, different expressions. So you could honestly say that the monks were, you know, they were the first to start to understand the concept of terroir, of different soil types, and of different levels of quality, like a crew system. It's, it's, to me, it's not surprising that so many of the great uh, innovations in alcohol happened in monasteries, because, you know, if you take away one of men's vice, then, you know, they're not left with an awful lot else to do. So, you know, you start, you know, you, you, no sex, so go with booze, basically. And, and, you know, it's why there's a noble and long history and tradition 
of viticulture, beer brewing, look at the Trappist monks in Belgium, uh, look at Buckfast, I mean Buckfast Lee Abbey uh, in Devon, well hey, yeah, um, there you go, you know, they, these are monks, they've got nothing else to do, they brew, they ferment, um, they distill. So the Cistercians really in the 1300s were the ones that started to nail Burgundy properly. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's, it, Burgundy is very complex and we could do a whole session on Burgundy and I'd, I'd be talking for an hour and a half and we'd barely have, uh, we'd, well, we'd barely have started. So in brief, um, the, the key area, and I'm gonna pull another map up now. Let's see if this one, I can do this a bit more uh, impressively. Um, hang on one second. Uh, right, so, aha. Um, so, you know, Burgundy, is a very venerable, very venerable region. Um, it's been making, uh, you know, incredible Pinot Noir and of course Chardonnay. Um, but the, ah, uh, here we go. Let's see if this works. Right. Uh, I've got someone holding it up bizarrely, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Wait a minute. Um, and da -da, right. Slightly odd one to be sharing. It's not me holding it up, but there we go. This is just so we can locate ourselves. So um, the, the, the wines, and there, is a, there are two, uh, with, you'll, some have one, some have the other that we're drinking this evening, but both come specifically from the Cote d'Or. So um, this is the region that is in the sort of uh, purpley mauve, um, mauve, yeah, mauve purple, not really purple, mauve here. Um, and the Cote d'Or literally means the golden slopes. And this is because you've got this wonderful, um, largely south facing there or thereabouts um, banks of beautiful uh, limestone soil rich vineyards, which um, are just perfect for uh, the, the growth of great Pinot Noir. And we have two absolute crackers here. So um, uh, some of you have the um, um, Bichot, um, Secret de Famille, um, Bourgogne de Cote d'Or, and some have the Du Monti Bourgogne Rouge. So um, the, they're, they're kind of... And she might have lost that. I, I'm, so basically we, uh, we, we ran out of, uh, we ran out of the, um, the B show uh, very early on. And so we, um, we, uh, subbed in with the um, with the Demo uh, sorry with the Monti with the um, De Rocher as well. So um, yeah, because Charlie's wine list yesterday for today had both of them, and I thought this is a bit odd. Um, I've uh, only got one of those. So yeah, no, did I? We we should no one should have De Monti. We should have De Rocher and Bichot are the other two. So I think mo some have one and some have the others. So I'll and I'll talk about both. So obviously um, those who got Domaine du Rocher did rather better than those of us who got the um, Albert Bichon. Well, actually, <laughs> I, I, I think to be wholly fair, the, um, the prices indicated on the tasting sheet uh, were, were referring to the 18 vintage of the... Um... I'm only pulling your leg, don't worry. Well, no, no, but it's a, it's a fair point because they are slightly different. They are slightly different, but I'll, I'll yeah. talk about both of them and, 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 and give, I give everyone a little perspective on two because they're two of our absolute favourites. So um, both... <laughs> firmly in in the coat door um and we've got um, um albert bichot one of the oldest uh, maisons one of the biggest um in terms of their land holdings they've got vines and vineyards and domains running from chablis in the north near alps there all the way down into beaujolais um they are um uh, an amazing producer they're, the, they're one of our kind of key partners. They're also the biggest buyers for the Hospice de Bone, the wonderful charity auction for the Burgundy wines that happens every November. Uh, we did our first barrels this year, in fact, which was amazingly good fun. We'll be doing a lot more on that front. Um, and just to give you a bit more perspective about Burgundy generally, um, it's, it's now about four and a half thousand hectares under vine. Um, in the Cote d'Or specifically. So again, that's the, um, the area here between uh, Dijon and Beaune. Um, and the crew system I alluded to when we were talking about the monks earlier, you've got Grand Cru makes up about 2% of the production, Premier Cru makes up about 12%, and then 
uh, you've got the village wines underneath. So um, with the uh, Bichot wine here, you've got an absolute uh, uh, an absolute belter because this is in fact wines. This is grapes that comes from uh, Chambon Musigny, from Marcenay, um, a little bit from Nuit Saint Georges, where the domain is based. In fact, and it's bottled as a Cote d'Or Bourgogne. So it's basically it's, it it can't be a single village wine because it includes three or four different villages, but it's at that level. So um, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's um, it sees about twenty percent new oak, um, you know, just to give it a bit more bit more structure and intensity. Um, and apart from that, you know, it's from uh, the glorious seventeen vintage, which we really love, which was the first year in Burgundy in about three or four vintages where they had a decent sized crop they weren't beset by frost and hail uh, in, to anywhere near the degree that the Burgundians have suffered in recent years so it was a good sized crop um wonderfully cool fresh elegant year oh some zooming in on the map here we go uh can you zoom in the map wait a minute uh doo -doo -doo. thank you mark there we go so i'm zooming in i hope that's useful for those who are oh, that's maybe a bit too much so with with the Bichot wine, they are based here in Nuit Saint Georges, but they have domains literally from Algser in Chablis all the way down. I'm, I'm not going to go down there, but down to um, Beaujolais. Um, and then the um, Du Rocher are based ever so slightly further north here in Gervais Chambertin. Um, now, interestingly, um, Bichot own 104 hectares of uh, of vines throughout the region. So they have a real uh, ability to pick and choose. Um, whereas um, Pierre de Rocher, who's a fifth generation winemaker, they have, and let me just check, I think it's about four, four and a bit, it might be six and a bit. Um, hang on, oops, come back, come back, come back. Uh, yeah, so they have about six, about six hectares, in fact, um, which they're adding to um, uh, every year, which is nice. But similarly, so both the 2017, both have about 20% new oak. Um, what is glorious about the vintage um, is this transparency to the terroir. It was not a, a really solar vintage like uh, the 2018, which followed on. So you get this, in both wines, you get this wonderful freshness and elegance, this finesse. Um, Pierre de Rocher compared the 2017 vintage, as did a number of growers. He said it has the sort of um, deafness, elegance, sweetness, and subtle fruit of the 2007, but with some of the tension, uh, structure, um, and kind of hidden depth of power of the 2010, which I rather like. I will lose the map now so I can see all you lovely people. Um, Jeremy, um, your question, how does Bichot compare in size to Faverly? Um, I'm, I'm going to fudge it slightly and say broadly similar. I mean, Faverly is another big, um, uh, another big maison. Um, actually, Charlie, maybe you wouldn't mind just um, grabbing the stats on that. As I said, you know, Bichot is 104 um, I'm just trying to dig it out, but um, no, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll have a look if I can get it out. Faverly, I would say, is probably, it must be there or thereabouts, for sure. Um, it's another another great performing house, for sure. Yeah. Um, Sam asking, does De Rocher use native yeasts? Um, no, they don't. It's ones that are cultivated, but cultivated specifically um, for... Um, uh, for the for the grapes that the uh, the clones rather that um, Pierre has probably the most interesting thing about well that's not true an interesting thing about De Rocher is that they have some very very old vines in their Gevry Chambertin vineyards um, the grapes wouldn't be used in the, the generic Bourgogne but um, certainly um, they have some very old vines which make some very very interesting uh, Gevry Chambertin Premier Cruise in particular. Um, I think the probably the, the difference between the two wines is the um, the Du Rocher 
probably has slightly less supple fruit and more energy and tension, whereas those of us who have um, the Secret de Famille, it's a slightly more rounded wine, it's slightly more supple, it's slightly more uh, fruit dominant. But um, for me, they're two brilliant examples of, of why Burgundy remains so attractive, uh, why it remains the heartland of Pinot Noir, and frankly, why the 2017 vintage is, is one we should pay a lot of attention to. Um, any more questions or comments on, on Burgundy at all? Please do, please do um, launch in. Anyone who would like to say anything, can I ask, I think Cote d'Or is a relatively new appellation, well, not a new appellation, but a new description for the lower slopes, is that right? Yeah, so very good point, Sue. In fact, <laughs> um, it's, it's so new that um, when this wine was made, it didn't exist. So the, the 2017 was the first vintage of the uh, Bichot uh, Secret de Famille, and it, it didn't, I didn't actually, um, it didn't actually exist as a as a uh, as, as a term, so now it does, and it's it's very specifically um, concentrating, obviously, on the on the more quality uh, vineyards. They they could, in fact, even label it as a uh, Côte de Nuit, um, a Bourgogne Côte de Nuit, because I, I think now all the vineyards, um, all the vineyards that are the source the fruit is sourced from are in the Côte de Nuit, but they call it Côte d'Or because it looks better on the label and they want to offer great value. So, yeah. Um, so it's a quick couple of questions there on the chat there. What, what proportion of Burgundy grapes are sold to negotiants from Jeremy? Um, um, funnily enough, it's, um, it's a good question because increasingly domains and even small growers are trying to make their own production. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's probably somewhere in the region of 30, 30 to 30% oh, or so, there or thereabouts. Um, but again, Charlie, maybe that's a, a, a stat you could look up. Um, we could find that um, it, the, the one thing with Burgundy, which is um, maybe a little bit challenging in a good way and a bad way, is that um, a lot of it is done on a handshake. A lot of stuff isn't written down, um, which is which makes it kind of quite difficult to, to get people to tell you, you know, where their grapes come from, who they're selling to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a degree of obfuscation there, which which is sort of charming in some respects and maybe a touch frustrating in others. Um, well, I think the other problem is, is that uh, also I'll interject is that a lot of people, especially in Burgundy, but France in general, that they won't actually want to say what they're really doing. So they'll they'll hide some numbers. They don't really want to say where they're buying their fruit from. They won't really say if they're a negociant or a trader or not, because it puts them into different um, into di into different groups. So very difficult to to actually answer that question one hundred percent. Yes, I mean that's a very diplomatic, a very diplomatic uh, way of putting it. There's, there's, um, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of room for ne negotiation. Um, uh, ah, so let, well, let's just explain what a negotiation is. That's probably a much easier question to uh, to answer. Um, so uh, we we have a, a concept, or we have an idea of, of winemakers in Burgundy generally being you know, small domain, small growers like Pierre with, you know, up to, you know, five or six hectares or there or thereabouts of, of, of vines. Um, but actually, um, a number of producers in Burgundy, they don't necessarily um, own their vineyards. They, they have long standing, I mean, by long standing, we mean, you know, generations old contracts with small growers to buy their grapes. And they the, these were the houses like Bichot, like Jadot, uh, like Chanson, like Faverly that we've mentioned, who um, I think sometimes in the in the recent past have been considered, you know, oh, the big guys. Um, and and yet, you know, where we've preferred smaller domains. However, um, actually, they were responsible for keeping Burgundy alive in the very difficult kind of post-war years. 
And of course, the access they have to some of the best fruit and the best parcels from different smaller growers who can't make their own wines, not sustainable, means that you tend to get um, uh, uh, you know, incredible value, uh, great quality wines from the negociants. So the simple answer is they tend to be the bigger houses who will own a certain percentage of their um, of their vines, like Bichot with uh, you know 104 hectares, but they will also have access to and buy uh, fruit from a number of other growers. You know, Bicho has been operating since the 1830s as well. I think their first, um, uh, they, they were founded in 1831, I think it says on the, on the label. Um, so, you know, they've got a huge pull. So I'm, I'm conscious that, um, God, time is racing away with us, in fact. So um, maybe we should, I mean, as I said, Burgundy, Burgundy deserves a whole session. The, the background behind me, this is, this is Burgundy, in fact, you know, um, that's my house in Burgundy. Uh, it's not my house in Burgundy, no. Um, I wish that it were probably worth about a million pounds, and that's just the, the space underneath it to plant, plant grapes. But we'll, we'll move on from Burgundy for now, um, because I don't obviously want to cut um, old Timo Meyer short of his uh, allotted time in the sun. Hmm. All righty. So the bloody hill, um, the bloody hill. I'm going to pull up a map of uh, of Yarra next. Let's see if I can do this slightly more competently than uh, <laughs> my previous maps. Um, oh, okay. This one, this one just might work. It might just work. Okay, let's have a look. Um, bum, bum, bum. Bingo. Okay, so hopefully you should all be looking at um, a map of Australia. Uh, the um, west of Australia is kind of um, right on the corner there, um, slightly in its own area, as you can see highlighted, but we're ignoring that, we're not there. We're right down in the south. So if you can find Melbourne, some of you have been there, I'm sure some of you know it well. Um, here we go. Here we go, uh, perfect. Um, and you'll find that we are now in the vineyard area, which I suppose probably a little bit less known to Australian wine lovers. Um, you know, when, when we think of Australia, maybe we think of um, Barossa Valley, we think of Shiraz, maybe we think of uh, Hunter Valley, for example, maybe we think um, even of Adelaide Hills or McLaren Vale. You know, we, and we tend to think of um, Cabernets and Shiraz, maybe the old Chardonnay as well. But actually, without betraying my biases too much, um, I really love uh, the Pinot Noirs from down here in the south near Melbourne, in fact. And we've got a few areas that make fascinating wines, Geelong, uh, Mornington Peninsula, and the Yarra Valley here. Um, which in some respects is quite possibly the most, uh, the most interesting of them all. And we're certainly dealing with one of the superstar producers. Um, so I'm gonna come out of this map briefly. Again, if anyone wants to go back in, just let me know. Um, we are um, about 45 kilometers east of Melbourne. Um, someone's, is that Papa you saying you love the, oh, oh the virtual vineyard sourcing bloody hill bottle hang on uh, oh i see yes yeah, so i thought i've actually got another image here i'm gonna i'm gonna do something wait a minute just so you can see um because i think it's only appropriate uh only appropriate as we're moving to bloody hill uh now where is it here we go i'm scared of the background that's going to turn up now yeah oh no i i saved it just now oh so annoying i I, I had a picture. I oh, know. Wait a minute. No, I can get it. I'm going to get it. Sorry. It'll, it'll be totally worth the wait. I absolutely promise. Um, whilst whilst we're doing that, give this wine a good air rate in your glass because it, it it needs it. Oh, here we go. Right. Perfect. And also, while you're doing it, tell us why it's called Bloody Hill. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Um, so the neck. Ah, perfect. Oh, can you see it? Bloody Hill? Of course. 
uh, rather annoyingly, the way that this silly camera works, it's bloody, it's inverted it, so it's reading in mirror writing. Anyway, anyway, um, I'll, Sue, I, I'll come on to the name in just a second. Um, um, just talk a little bit briefly more about the region, about Yarra. Um, it's, it's cool climate. Now, what does cool climate mean in the new world? Basically, it's, uh, it's actually cooler than Bordeaux, but warmer than Burgundy. So, you know, you're not going to expect a, 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 an exact replica of Burgundy, and neither we should. But at the same time, we're certainly not talking with the sort of uh, talking about the same sort of heat that you find in the Barossa or McLaren Vale. It's, you know, it's it's therefore it's the sort of slightly cooler, slightly damper climate which actually favours Pinot Noir. Um, first plantings here in the Yarra were 1838. Um, and now there are 80 wineries, um, which isn't a huge number, frankly. But it's interesting that the region also includes um, the base for uh, Mouet and Chandon's um, uh, New World Outpost, um, Domain Chandon, which is in Coldstream. So it's interesting, of course, that, you know, good Pinot Noir also, and this is another session which we'll do, of course, tends to be the bedrock and backbone for great um, uh, sparkling wines as well. However, obviously tonight we're dealing uh, with the red stuff. Um, so Timo is German and he grew up near Stuttgart and um, he, <laughs> I, he, he traveled, let's put it that way, he traveled, worked in hospitality for a bit, uh, he traveled, you know, he, he, he was, um, he was a, a wanderer, a wanderer I think is the best, uh, best, best way of describing him and his wife who he met in uh, Florida actually comes from Melbourne so uh, when they had a child en route um, they decided to move back to sort of uh, her homeland and um, you know Timo started working by with the famous de Bortoli uh, winery in fact in Yarra um, driving a tractor and um, you know got a huge love for wine um, really got to learn about um, uh, the region uh, and the opportunities. And then um, in 1998, um, he bought this two and a half hectare vineyard called, well, it, well, it, it, it wasn't called Bloody Hill, but you can, the ridge behind me uh, is basically, it, it's kind of right onto the, uh, the beginnings of the great uh, dividing mountain range and there was some land next to this which was quite a lot more expensive and then there was this land which basically sheep were grazing on and it was considered really difficult to farm because it was well bloody steep so that's why it's called the bloody hill quite literally I'm not joking it's it's bloody hill because it was bloody steep it was bloody hard work to make the wines and that was that was what it was so I I always thought it had some reference to a battle or something like that, you know, but, but no, it's quite literally, it was just bloody hard work. So two and a half uh, hectares of, of fabulous, uh, fabulous, quite, this area of the Yarra is um, um, slightly younger soils than uh, the older part because, um, uh, and sorry, and, and as a result, um, this higher area has slightly more uh, red, rocky, almost vo uh, volcanic soil influence. And maybe if you just put your nose in the wine as well. Um, mm, again, you, you almost get, for me, you almost get some of that character of Etna's uh, Nerello Mascalese, for example, that slightly kind of volcanic struck match kind of sulfur character um so i completely get that in the wine so um timo is uh, a bit of a revolutionary i'm going to share i'm going to share one more screen with you because uh, it's one of my favorites um and i think you'll appreciate this um he his philosophy is bring back the funk you know, he, he wants to make wines which are very, very uh, natural. Um, you know, he, he farms organically. He uses the bare minimum of, uh, of any, 
any chemicals, of course, in the in the winery after the grapes come in. It, this is natural yeast. Someone's asked about natural yeast. So this is natural yeast. Um, no filtering, no fining. Some of his other cuvées, he does up to 100% whole bunch fermentation, so keeping them, uh, you know, all on the stems. Uh, this one isn't though, but the wines are definitely, you know, uh, very, very real, very authentic, um, very un unmarked by man's influence. Now, I just, like I said, I just want to pull up my uh, my other screen here. Uh, here we go. So I'm just going to share this briefly. So uh, right here we go. Bingo. So um, hopefully you can all see that. That that is Timo Meyer's website. There is quite literally nothing more you will find about Timo Meyer on his own website than that. That's it. So you know, small farm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, natural wines, uh, unfiltered, unfined. We don't do back labels and barcodes, bring back the funk. Uh, and that's it. That, that is quite literally all you get. Um, that's all you get. So um, I, I, find that, I find that brilliantly uh, refreshing, in fact. Um, he has become one of the acknowledged uh, new wave superstars um, of the region. And his wines, for me, I think it was, it's an interesting one to finish with because they ally some of the, the new world um, richness and ripeness that we saw in the Grace Bridge, but clearly with a very definable sense of terroir um, and a real kind of minerality here. This is, you know, these volcanic red rock soils rather than more the limestone we saw in the Burgundy, but um, uh, it's a really fascinating blend of, uh, uh, of um, old school and new school, if you like. Um, Jeremy, I've just seen your comment about not much oak. So actually, um, it's not that there's not much oak, it's just the oak is big oak. So it's 500 litre, 500 litre sort of, you know, what, what we would call in Italy, the kind of uh, botti grandi. It's not the 200, 250 litre barrels, it's the big ones. Um, and within that, only um, up to 30% maximum is new oak, but that's not with this wine. With the bloody bloody hill, I think it's ten or fifteen percent only. Um, one interesting thing to note, as well about the wine, which gives it that freshness and that zippiness, which we don't always associate with Australian reds, even Pinot Noir, is he deliberately picks about twenty plus percent of the grapes uh, early as in deliberately slightly prior to them being perfectly phenolically ripe, just to ensure that they have this really good acidity and this good backbone. Um, and I think you really get that in this wine. You really get the, the acidity on the palate. You get this kind of slight green pepper character on the nose as well. Mm. Mm. And Mark, Mark and Catherine, just looking at your comment there, will this develop typical Pinot Noir characteristics? Yes, I think it definitely will. In fact, you know, the, that slight barnyard element is already beginning to show. I mean, you know, these are, you know, I think what we'll see with age with Timo's wine is the sweetness of the fruit will start to come through a bit more. In fact, it's almost like we've, we've started with the, we've started with the barnyard and we want the fruit to come through. Um, you know, whereas um, a lot of New World Pinot, you start with a lot of fruit and Ribena and just hope to hell there'll be some barnyard and, and secondary tertiary evolution coming out. Um, David's just saying really like one and three for the price one is really good. What's the differentiator? Uh, to, David, to be honest, it's a pretty simple answer. Um, Scotto Cellars is a very sizable operation. Um, they're sourcing fruit uh, from different growers in those two regions of Monterey and Sonoma, as I mentioned. Um, they're very well britched. Um, whereas, you know, Timo has, as I said, two and a half hectares and is farming completely organically, uh, natural wines, much more labor intensive. It's a lot of it is production costs. And to be fair, stylistically, there is, um, more potential for evolution, shall we say, 
with Timo's wines. I think they are more, um, uh, well, let's say that they've got a more authentic voice to them. And I think they have the opportunity for greater complexity um, as they develop. Now, team, I'm, I'm conscious that we're, uh, we're, uh, we're at 7.30 already. This, this hour just flies by. Um, so um, I don't want to keep anyone who has uh, wild parties to get to. Um, but, um, but of course, I'm not going anywhere just yet. So um, uh, anyone wants to continue commenting or, uh, or asking questions, if I've missed anything, then, then please let's come back to it. Um, oh, Jeremy, your, your question, how long to keep the bloody hill? This is 2018, and um, Timo says that the 18 vintage is actually very similar to the um, uh, 18 vintage in Europe. I, it was, you know, a bit of rain at the beginning, but quite, you know, moderate climate, and then a very warm, uh, very warm solar summer, which was largely uninterrupted by rains. Um, I think that this has given a wine which is very pleasant to drink now. However, I'd love to tuck it away for a year or maybe two and drink it over five to seven years after that, possibly longer. I'm just too thirsty and greedy, basically. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So interesting comment there from um, from uh, uh, Papadou there. Um, Myra is refined as an organic dynamic producer. At most of yeah. So uh, it's a it's a very interesting point that you know the, there are uh, there are some producers who follow certain um, um, philosophies and rules. And their resulting wines are very authentic, very true to the character they want to express, but completely undrinkable. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there are others who use the precepts of uh, organic viticulture, biodynamism, non -in or minimal intervention winemaking as a way to express the, the the best of the grapes that they have and I, and I definitely think that Meyer is is on the uh, you say refined it's a much better word I was using accessible but definitely the refined end of this spectrum certainly you know these aren't these aren't wines he doesn't make wines which are um, which are difficult to to enjoy I have to say I have to agree yeah any more comments I'm, I'm looking at the chat there um, Future chases, we hear more about the growers. Yes, Benjamin, we definitely can. Yes, in fact, and in fact, what we can do is send you some more notes as well about uh, about the individuals concerned. That would be good. Yeah. In fact, actually, Benjamin, um, a, uh, a a one thing to point out is we do have um, quite a few grower tastings. Uh, you've probably seen as well on the wine therapy session. So where we just literally hone on in on a particular grower and they they join us basically so we've got clemens bush next week we've got jonathan maltus i think uh week after that or the week after that we've got a english sparkling wine uh, producer one of our favorites versus one of our amazing champagne growers so um yeah i think um it's nice to do a bit more of a grower focus when we can sure well, although having a, a grower focus with timo could be quite a frightening experience actually He's a lovely, lovely man, but he doesn't um, cut corners when he, he wants to express what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've known quite a few people who got offended just by his uh, casual jokes. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I think he's like his wines. He's very authentic, raw, pure, you know, uh, et cetera. Oh, my. <laughs> um, um, uh, hello, this just, uh, this, uh, my, my wife, uh, Teresa, coming in to top up her glass. Um, yeah, there we go. We're, we're, we're drawing things to a conclusion now, I think. But, um, oh, which English sparkling from Zoe? Um, thank you, Max, um, for your comments. Which English sparkling? Um, we're thinking about that right now. We, we, we do lots of work with Whiston, with Exton Park, with Gusbourne. Um, Night Timber, of course, is fabulous. Um, Herbert Hall, um, and, and um, we've done stuff with Coates and Seeley in the past. Also, wonderful Hoffman and Rathbone, uh, who make my now second favourite uh, English red, and and that that could be a session we'll do. English red wines, 
I watch everyone immediately dropping off, dropping off the feed straight away. Uh, no, trust me, they are they are getting quite good, and the 2018 vintage is uh, is is actually going to be the vintage which uh, puts English Reds on the map. You heard it here first and possibly last, but no, they're they're very very good indeed. Um, now, any more? What have we got there? Simpson, Simpson Pinot Noir. Okay, right. We we'll have to look out for that, Mark. Okay, yep. Um, I'm having another. I'm having another go on the um, on the team though. I have to say, I love this. Um, one thing I think, well, yet another thing I should say that I love about Timo Meyer is, um, despite this kind of sense of authenticity and honesty and purity and earthiness. Um, if you look at his his two top wines, the close planted and the Doctor Pinot. Um, in fact, Charlie, do you want to? Can you go online and gr just grab a label shot of the uh, the top two wines? This is I, I think this is absolutely brilliant. Um, he basically uh, has exactly the same label design as our Armand Rousseau's Chambertin. Um, so if you if you know your Rousseau Chambertin, then maybe it's going to be too difficult to show that. Uh, Charlie, if you if you if you pull up my Inst oh I say if you pull up my Instagram feed, then it's got a picture of the two labels side by side. Hang on, it's, it's coming up now. Go with me one second. Uh, the benefit of some kind of computer degree. Uh, 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 yeah, here we go. Ooh, everyone's just dropped off. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Oh, share screen. Uh, can we all see that? There we go. There we go. Oh, no, there we go. There we are. That's sorry. We'll have to might have to zoom in. Control plus, I think it is. Yeah. So you can see that the label down there. And now have a good look at that label. Um, and now Charlie, maybe if you just pull up a, a, a quick image of the Armand Rousseau Chambertin, then people can oh, see. Oh blimey! It. What do you, do you, anything else, sir? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, like you can you can. Close your screen for now and come back to uh, all the lovely people. Um, I don't think uh, I can... Okay, yeah, let me just do that. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Oh, sorry, was there a comment there? From yeah, but you, you can do it, Charlie. I know, I know, I know. I'm being, I'm being the, just, you know, lots, lots of excitement. Uh, a, where... a, a few comments while Charlie's doing that. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that Snay has spilt wine on the sofa. That is unforgivable. Red wine on the sofa. And it looked like quite a light coloured sofa too. That is pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, oh dear. Uh, oh dear me. Um, so um, otherwise, um, there was a comment of value. Value William there. Commenting on the relative value between regions. Um, Pinot Noir is always expensive. Pinot Noir is always expensive. It's why I, I made that comment about uh, the Richard Hemmings quote about, about you know the holy grail for uh, red wine is finding in in a Pinot Noir under fifteen pounds. Um, Pinot Noir is expensive wherever you go. In terms of value, um, um, I think you get tremendous value from Australia. Um, I think you you get tremendous value from a subset of producers in Burgundy especially in vintages like 17, which really flatter um, the kind of village and lieu de level of, of wines. I have to say, I am becoming increasingly a massive fan of German Pinot Noir as well. So Spät Burgunder. I, I think we're for, ah, here we go. And thank you, Charlie. So, so, so that's, that's a bottle for it. Charlie, pull the screen down so we can see the bottle price as well. So this is, this is the Chambertin oh, from uh, Armand yeah, yeah. There you go, perfect. And as you can see, that is not, that is not per case, that is per bottle. Um, so, uh, you know, Timo's top uh, bottling, the Bloody Hill is about 50 quid a bottle, there or thereabouts. And I love the fact that he's gone for the same exact same label design as uh, Rousseau Chambertin, which is four grand a bottle. So there we go. Um, fair play to him. So I was just saying uh, the, the big um, revelation that German Pinot Noir, Spätburgunder, uh, well, well worth looking out for some fabulous examples. And increasingly, as global warming becomes more of an issue, 
um, the cooler regions further north, um, like Germany, and I mean this, I absolutely mean this, like England, um, are, are becoming very attractive. The I had a bottle of the Gusborne Pinot Noir 2018 uh, last week, which um, Charlie Holland, the winemaker, sent me, and it's stunning. Honestly, I, I give us another 10 years. Uh, we're going to lose the lower lying regions of, uh, you know, the, the, the country, admittedly, but we're going to have some great Pinot. So, you know, it swings and roundabouts, frankly. Um, now, are there any more that I'm just going to be looking at the chat here? Uh, mm, Alto Arduce Pinot Nero. Oh, now, well, yes. I mean, there's another region too. Um, the South Tyrol. Uh, makes stunning Pinot, um, produces like Hochstatter, like uh, Cantina Terlan, like um, Elena Valch. I mean, gorgeous Pinot Noir. They, for, for me, they all have a slight, uh, it's, not a, it's not a fault at all, but it's a very recognizable kind of tobaccic quality. The first thing you, you smell is this slight kind of tobacco and almost like polished, polished wood character, but wonderful Pinots. Um, and, and they age very interesting as well. I, I've had uh, from Magnum, I've had uh, um, 80, the Alto Arge Pinots from 88, uh, 86, and, and they can age really well. So some very interesting Pinot there too. Yeah. Um, uh, Blau Burgunda is Pinot Noir in Austria. Um, and Spät Burgunda, although to be fair, they've also got Frau, Frau Burgunda Sioux as well. Sorry, that was that Sue. No, it wasn't. That was Mark and Catherine. Peggy, pardon. Um, so Spät is the is the Pinot Noir that, as we know it from Burgundy. Um, m and do a passable German Pinot called called Platina for a tenor. Well, Stefan Don, there we go. There, well, there you go. I said it was good value. Um, that's tremendous value. Um, that's that's irritatingly good value, frankly. Um, but but no no that there you go it just goes to show you you know you would not find Burgundy these days for for ten pounds uh, the fact that MNS who I have to say you know have a, a very very respectable uh, uh, wine range you know the fact that they can find a good um, German Pinot for ten I, I I'd say if you haven't tried it before have a go and see what you think and then move on to something else okay any um, oh hang on is there something that I've missed um, Oh, so Zoe, they're saying um, not being a, neither been a, neither been a fan of Pinot, totally converted by the De Rocher. What is it about this wine? That I have to say is a question I struggle to answer because um, is it? I, I you know the, the De Rocher style of wines is never about density or richness, but it is about intensity. So maybe um, um, maybe. Maybe it's just cutting through all that very ripe, rich Shiraz that you've been drinking. I don't know, but certainly, you know, De, De Rocher is not a heavy wine, but it's certainly got a real intensity and energy to it. So maybe that's it. Mm. Um, oh, so, oh gosh, guys, we're, we're, we're coming up to uh, quarter two and I'm sure everyone wants to go and do some, um, uh, some cheering and clapping for our lovely and wonderful NHS uh, guys and girls. So maybe um, can we do a quick cheers so we can get a photo? Um, it really has been wonderful to see you all. I have to say thank you for joining. Totally appreciate it. Um, and um, yeah, cheers. Here's to Pinot Noir. And here's to yeah, our NHS for that matter. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Cheers. Big love. See you same time next week.